welcome to worship here at Cross of Glory. Today we have a special service. We're celebrating Reformation Sunday today, so uh, focusing not specifically on all the events that happened during the Reformation, but the principles of the Reformation, where, where Martin Luther and other reformers brought back to the forefront an emphasis on Scripture alone and grace alone and faith alone as the means by which we obtain our salvation. All that centering, of course, on Christ alone, our Savior. So that's our theme for this morning. We'll be talking a lot more about that throughout the service. All the hymns and songs are focused on that. We'll hear a couple choirs singing for us today, including the kids. So pretty exciting things we have in store for us this morning as we focus on God and his word and all he's done for our salvation. So we'll begin our service by, uh, by singing our opening hymn, How Firm a Foundation. May God bless our worship together this morning. <laughs> I invite you to stand, please, if you're able. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. For faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing.
O Holy Spirit, by the power of the gospel, you created faith in our hearts, faith in Jesus as our only Savior, and faith to live as his disciples. Never let us doubt that you have the power to do what you have promised. Instead, strengthen our faith as we grow in your word. And finally, lead us by faith to the eternal promised land. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson this Reformation Sunday is written for us in Genesis 15, verses 1 through 6, where we hear about Abraham and the, the promises that God made to Abraham and how Abraham received those promises. The Bible tells us he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So too we believe that by faith we are credited as righteous in God's sight. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is the word of our God. At this time, we'll hear an anthem by our elementary school choir. I invite them to the front. Stay right where you're at. Good 
move these back, Mrs. Jeffers, really quick. All right, so step down one step. First row first. Okay, one step. Down one step. Okay, now you guys go down one step. Now the big kids go down one step. Now sit. Hmm. <laughs> Usually I sit up there, but it was too hard to get you guys to all sit there. So, all right. So, I have to share with you one of my favorite TV shows when I was growing up. It was actually the reruns by the time I got to see them, because it was in black and white. Um, some of the older ones are going to remember. I'm going to play the opening theme for it, and let's see if they can guess what it is, okay? So here we go. Hold on, my speaker's covered up. Try this again. There we go, volume's down. Let's try it one more time. See, did you see the Lone Ranger wore a mask? Nobody knew who he was. He had a faithful sidekick called Tonto. See, they watched it. Okay? And they were the crime fighters of old back in the Old West. And they were given the job to go find the criminals and get them and, and take them and put them into justice in the jail. They were the heroes of the time. At the end, after the show was all down, all done, as he was riding off into the sunset, what did they say? He said, hi, oh, silver, and then what did they say? Who was, who was that masked man? Who was that masked man? When Jesus lived on this earth, he went around helping people, too. He fed the hungry, he healed the sick, he made the blind man uh, see, he, he made the lame walk. After Jesus healed someone, it was not unusual to hear someone in the crowd ask, Who is this man? He wasn't mask, mask, masked, though, but in a way he was, because he was also true God and true man. Jesus heard people asking that question, and he also heard the answers that people gave. One day, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say I am? The disciples answered, well, some say you're John the Baptist, others think you're Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Come back to life. Jesus said to Peter, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter spoke up and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, You are absolutely right, Peter. And on that confession, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, the whole church will be built upon, because I have come to save the world. And he did. He came as our substitute. He died on the cross, paid for every single one of our sins. Who was that man? Our Savior, true God, Jesus Christ. Well, many people today don't know Jesus and are asking, who is this man? People give many answers. 
Some say he was a great teacher. Some say he was a great prophet, a religious leader. But our real answer that we can give to them is the same that Peter gave when Jesus asked him. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We pray. Jesus, we confess that you are Christ, the Son of the living God, the one in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, you can go back with your parents. We continue with our verse of the day, written for us in 11, uh, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Hallelujah. Gospel reading is written for us in Matthew chapter 16, which we just heard about a little bit in the kids' sermon there. Uh, but the, the thing we'll focus on for ourselves today, this theme that everything is by faith. And it's on Peter's confession, on, on the faith that Peter had that God's church is, is built. On the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord. We continue with our sermon hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, whom we place all of our trust and our faith in, dear brothers and sisters. Have you ever wanted something really, really bad? Maybe it was a new car. You went out shopping for it. You found the one you liked. You got all the options you liked. You really wanted it. So you go back, you go home, and you look at your budget. Oh, it's tight. Well, if I move this around and I move that around, if I do this and I work a couple extra jobs, I can get it. And you run as fast as you can to trade in your old jalopy. That was only a couple years old. And you get your favorite new car. But then about a month or so afterwards, you start to wonder if it's worth it. You know, the ramen that you've been eating every other day to cut costs, it doesn't taste so tasty anymore. And that new car's already gotten two door dings, and you didn't realize that your kid spilled milk in the back seat on a 110 degree day, and you didn't catch it till the next day when you smelled it. And you cried over spilled milk. What you wanted gave you happiness for just a little bit of time, but it didn't last. Or there's the little girl who, who needed an operation and was terrified. Terrified about going and having this operation done. So her parents, her parents promised to give her something that she had wanted for the longest time. She wanted a little kitten. The surgery, the operation went well, and as the anesthesia was wearing off, the, young, the youngster was, was heard mumbling, this sure is a lousy way to get a cat. Or there's Martin Luther, the reformer of the Christian church back in the 1500s. He felt the same way. He was striving to live life in such a way that he felt that God would be happy with him. He felt that he could earn, strive to earn God's favor. He did whatever he could, but it only led him to despair and anger toward God because couldn't stop himself from sinning. And he was wondering if it was worth it. He was never sure of his salvation. Or there's you and I, Christians, who endure hardship and make sacrifices for the Lord and we may at times be tempted to feel the same way. The Lord Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Well, we may wonder if all this is, is really worth it to carry that cross. Is the time that you spend worshiping your God really worth it? Is the struggle that you engage in to put off your pet sins that plague you day in and day out, is it worth it? Are the unkind words that people speak to you when you speak to them about Christ, is it really worth it? Our text for today from God's Holy Scriptures sets before us the example of Abraham and gives us the assurance that neither Abraham nor we ourselves will ever eternally regret carrying any cross for our Lord. Our theme for today is by faith. 
And this morning we're going to study what faith teaches us, where it came from, and where we're going, and that will help us understand to live here and now. So our sermon text is Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, and 8 through 12. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac, his son, and Jacob, his grandson, who were heirs with him of that same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. This is our sermon text. This letter of the book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians who were being tempted to go back to Judaism because of persecution. In order to persuade them not to throw away their faith, the author wanted these Christians to realize that if they left Christianity, they would not be deserting to the prophets of old. They'd be going away from them. Hebrews 11 emphasizes that the Old Testament believers were saved, saved the same way that New Testament believers are. Through faith in God's promises. Through faith in the promised Messiah. And so... We have to answer a question. What exactly is faith? Is it, as the U.S. journalist H.L. Uh, Mencken said, is it an illogical belief in the occurrence of the improbable? Or is it, like some people might say, a blind leap in the dark? Or is it, as some might say, a disregard? of the facts? Or is it a fuzzy feeling inside that everything is going to be okay? Verse 1 of our text gives us a much better definition. It says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is a solid trust in things that we cannot prove. This doesn't mean that, that faith is blind, however. Faith sees God's promises and bases its trust on that. For example, faith believes that the universe was formed at God's command. Verse 3. Well, we don't have a videotape of God's creation, that God created the world in this manner. We believe it because God said that that's the way it happened. That's faith. But that doesn't prove that it's not blind faith. I mean... What about all those supposed facts that the world was created by a big bang? Perhaps you've been taught in school that two masses collided and everything then came and evolved out of that. Of course, they never tell you where those masses come from. To tell you the truth, 
It actually takes more faith to believe that than what the Bible teaches. Let's examine some of those facts just so you see what I, I mean. We live in a, in, a, in a world of order, okay? There's laws, okay? So if I were to jump off these stairs and I want to go to the moon, is it going to happen? Where am I going to land? Right down there. See, even a first grader gets that. It's gravity. Okay, that's a law of order. The air that we breathe. There's just the right amount of oxygen for us to breathe. And you know, if there was more oxygen than what we have in our atmosphere, if someone would light a match, everything would go psh, and fire. Hmm, did that happen by chance? This time of year in the, in the north, all the, the geese fly up in the air, and they fly south, just like all the snowbirds, okay? That's why they call them that. And, you know, unlike the snowbirds who usually follow a map in their car, the birds don't need a map. It's amazing. They go back to the same exact spot every year. I want to know how they chose that spot in the first place. Maybe their mamas took them there. Hmm. You break a bone, and that bone gets set, and guess what happens? It heals. It forms back together. To believe that this complex yet orderly world could have come to existence through a big explosion, explosion is like if I drop this bag of Scrabble letters, and it formed a poem. <laughs> Peyton, come here a minute, really quick. Can you read the poem? Is there any two word, a word at all? Ooh, O-O, oh, oh. get two O's together. <laughs> okay, hang on, it's dumb. I'll let you pick these up later, okay, thanks. <laughs> You won't sit on the end next time, will you? Thanks, Peyton. You see, if we really descended by chance from apes and birds from dinosaurs, then there would have to be fossils that would show that, the in-betweens. But you know, for 150 years, scientists have been looking for those, and guess what? They have not found the missing links. And you know why they don't find them? Because they don't exist. Amazing. And they never did. Somebody didn't go, go dig them up and hide them. No, the Christians didn't do that. And you take a look at the world around you and see how wonderfully it was put together. You have to admit that there is an intelligent and powerful creator that's been at work. And what a comfort to know that you are not a cosmic accident, but a wonderful creation of God. With all of your gifts and abilities and attributes, created unique, special, as his holy child. That means we have a purpose on this earth as God said through the prophet Jeremiah, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Are you languishing in your job? Are you unsure where your marriage is going? Are you concerned what you're going to be when you grow up? Are you worried about school? Are you feeling the weight of responsibility of raising kids? Or maybe taking care of your parents? 
don't worry. God, God's got plans for you. Wonderful plans. Do you want to know what those plans are? Do you want to know where you're headed? Well, let's see what faith can teach us. The patriarch Abraham can teach us a lot about faith and where we're headed. When God told Abraham to leave his hometown and go to a place where he would show him, I mean, who of you would do that? Okay? Just pack up your business, close it down, and go. Your wife's going to think you're nuts. Or your husband. And you go. And listen to the voice of God where he sends you. Although he didn't have any idea where God was taking him, he knew that in the long run, and here's the point, he knew that in the long run, God was going to take him home to a place there's no more, where there's no more pain or sorrows. Verse 10 of our text tells us that Abraham knew where God was sending him. Abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He was looking forward to heaven. What happened here and now to him and where God was going to send him, it didn't really matter. In the same way, we may not know where God is going to take us here on this earth, but we know for sure that he is leading us to our eternal home. But, but isn't it wishful thinking to believe that there's a place called heaven where all of our sorrows and pain will be taken away? Isn't that just some form of escape man has made up to get away from all the harsh realities of life? Let me ask you this. Does it take any more faith to believe that heaven exists and that there's a place called the Amazon. Now, I'm not talking about a warehouse where you go buy stuff, okay? I'm talking about this place that we've heard about called the Amazon. Anybody here been to the Amazon? Ah, I didn't think so. How do you know it actually really exists? You can talk. How do you know? You've seen pictures, okay. Do you know anybody who's been there? Okay, well, I got one back there. You know somebody who's been there. Well, wait a minute, Kirsten. How do you know? How do you know that those pictures are really of the Amazon? And how do you know your friend is not pulling your leg and just kind of told you there's a place with indigenous peoples and little fish that eat your flesh and creepy crawly things and lots of jungles. I mean, how do you know? Unless you actually go there and see it. Okay, I know my example kind of limps because there's Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom and, and all those places, that those TV shows that National Geographic might have taken you there. But how do you know that's really there? Hmm. You really don't know. You have to take it on faith that what those videographers are showing you, those pictures or those people are telling you, is actually the Amazon, where there are rainforests and indigenous peoples and, and all that other stuff. Well, how is that really any different from believing that there's a heaven? Sure, we've never been there, but we know somebody who has been. Do you know who that is? Jesus. Jesus once said, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And while we may not have had a photographic picture of heaven, we do have accounts in Scripture that tell us what heaven is like. Listen to this. Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, at once, I was in the, at once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow 
resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Should it really be any harder to believe that there's a place called heaven than there is that there is a place called the Amazon? No, in fact, it should be easier to trust and believe in our one true God that what he says is because he does not lie. You see, he has prepared heaven for you and for me. And he fulfilled his promise that he would send a Savior, and he did that by sending him to be our substitute, to die on the cross for every one of our sins, nailed there. And then he rose victorious. He's ascended there and he's there waiting to take us there someday. Believing in him so that you can live in this wonderful place is not, not something that's beyond belief. You can trust it. You see, this is what, what changed Luther's life. He learned as he studied scripture that God is not an angry God. Yes, he must punish sin. Yes, he requires perfection. But Luther learned that God gave him the righteousness that he could not earn for himself. He did that with his own son, Jesus. This, this changed everything for Luther. How he looked at life and how he approached life and what he did. All the troubles he had in life were now viewed differently. He knew that heaven was already his as a believer. He had that hope. He had that assurance. And knowing and believing that there's a place called heaven, one for you by your Savior, will affect the way we live here on earth. Faith, faith is more than just a special knowledge. It's like, it's like a homing beacon. Faith makes us restless here, like it did for Abraham, who wandered and wandered and wandered and lived in tents as a nomad all of his life. And so did his son, and so did his grandson. They never actually got to the promised land, but their descendants did. But they did get to the promised land, heaven. They end up living with hope. In the same way, we too keep our eyes focused on heaven. And when we do, it won't bother us that we don't have the latest gadgets. It won't bother us if we don't have our dream home or the fastest car on the block. Nor should our troubles keep us down either. None of these things, nothing, will compare to the riches that await us in heaven. The story is told about two men who were wandering, well, who were walking in a city in a cold, snowy, blustery, blowing wind night. And one man was wandering around from one place to another, to another, to another, trying to find protection from the weather. Another man walked briskly, humming down the street as he looked ahead to see the lights of his home where he knew that as he walked through that door would be warmth, a hot meal, a wonderful family waiting to embrace him. You know, we're like that man who knew his home was just up the street. Because we know that too. We know that when the snow is blowing, well, it doesn't happen down here, but when tough times come and they beat against us and they beat us down, <coughs> we're heading home. We're heading home. We're on our way. 
And Jesus promises that he will not let any evil keep us from that. Although we know that it's to our benefit to focus on heaven, how easy don't we become distracted? Eyes that should be raised heavenward are riveted on the earthly pleasures. Feet that should be marching heavenward are mired in earth's trenches and swamps. Hands that should be reaching for eternal treasures are wrapped around the gaudy marbles and things of this world. And the backs that should be straining to do kingdom work, work for our God, oftentimes are bent on our own earthly pursuits. Friends, don't let that happen. Because it doesn't lead to anything good. Put God first in everything. Leave behind whatever threatens to get in the way of your walk on that road to heaven. Whether it be a job, friends, family, bitterness, anger, don't stay in pity or grief. God has a plan for you, a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. Don't be afraid to throw off the security blankets of this world because guess what? God's already given you your security blanket, your robe of righteousness. Wear that. Wear it. He loves you. And he's promised you a home in heaven. Christians, hold on to that grace and mercy of our God. In grace, he has promised that a faith lived is a faith rewarded. In mercy, God promises all of our efforts to serve him and to live for him will not come without reward. So stand fast in your Christian faith that you profess. Live the Christian life that you profess. Hold on strongly to the promises that you have. And I don't care if you're a teenager. This is important. You may act like it's not anymore, but it is. Hold on to it. Bear patiently with the crosses that you bear. Because you are carrying them as an alien in a strange world. They're all going to be gone soon. They're going to be taken off your shoulders, and you will live in glory, praising your Heavenly Father. One poet, Rustoi, expressed it, It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Live by faith. With no regrets. Amen. Please rise. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll confess our faith according to the words of the, of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The choir will now sing.
At this time, we'll bring our gifts of love to the Lord. Guests and visitors who are with us, please don't feel obligated to give to our ministry, but if you're moved to do so, then you are, of course, welcome to. Lord Jesus, we praise you for coming into this world and living your life and, and giving it up on the cross to pay for all of our sins and guarantee us a place in your home of heaven, which is now our home as well. We bring these gifts to you today as a token of our love. We ask that you would use them to further your word among us and among our community and throughout the world. May it happen according to your will, Lord. I ask that you would please stand for our prayer of the church. Let us pray to the Lord for the Christian church on earth and for all people everywhere, for all who gather here today and for our entire congregation, that through the gospel the Lord would give us growth in faith and increase our love. We ask you to bless us, O Lord. For the spreading of the gospel throughout the world, for all pastors, missionaries, and their families, that they may boldly proclaim Christ to the nations. We ask you to hear us, O Lord. For the promises you have made to us and the trust you seek from us, for the faith you have given your people to believe in the saving work of our Savior Jesus, and for the Spirit's power to be faithful in the ministry you have given us to do, knowing that our labor in the Lord is not in vain, we magnify your name, O Lord. For the people of our country, for the Lord's blessings on our work, for those seeking employment, for good health, and for good weather, we beg for your mercy, O Lord. For all who are sick in body or mind, for the hungry and the homeless, for those who are in prison, for those who are dying and those who are mourning, we ask you to help them according to your will, O Lord. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you also our private petitions. All this we ask, O Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen. Please be seated.
We'll conclude our service with our final hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Thank you. 